let's talk about the mechanics of open world role playing. If you're a fan of this genre, you might have noticed that it died. It was replaced by open world action adventure games that are usually tagged as open world RPGs. Now, I'm not upset by that, tag drift happens all of the time, but I am upset that we're leaving behind the mechanics of open world role play. So I like to discuss those mechanics. In order to do that, I do have to draw a line between games that have open world roleplay mechanics in them and games that simply have that tag. The way we're going to do that is with these names. An open world roleplaying game is a game where the open world provides roleplay challenges and opportunities. An open world action adventure game is a game where the open world provides action-adventure opportunities. Nice and simple, right? For the sake of this video, this means that Breath of the Wild is not an open-world RPG. It's an open-world action-adventure game, because the world offers up a large number of action-adventure hooks and almost no role-playing hooks. That's not bad, it's just a different focus. Link is Link. Yes, you are technically in his shoes, but none of the challenges you face are about the nature of what you choose to make Link. Link is always going to be Link. You can't choose what Link likes or dislikes or what he wants to do with his life or what his arc is leading to. Link is just Link. And the world responds to Link in a very specific way, no matter how you make Link act, because the world doesn't know how to react to a different Link. You can't make Link different. The reason this is important is because I want to discuss the mechanics of open world roleplay, not the mechanics of open world action adventure. That's why I'm drawing this line. Now, some of you are probably thinking Skyrim's world mostly offers up action adventure stuff, not role playing stuff. Same is true of Dragon's Dogma. Isn't this kind of a very fuzzy rule? Why are those games so much more role play y? That's actually the point. The mechanics I want to talk about are mechanics that got less popular over time and were slowly replaced with mechanics that were more suitable for open world action adventure games, which is why the genre morphed. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that it's action y, and I'm not talking about, you know, the way that it's been dumbed down or not. No, that's not the point. The point is whether there are mechanics that allow you to have open world role play challenges or not. Let's talk about what the heck that even means. If you were to try and find games that count as open world role playing according to the definition that we have here in this video, you'd have a rough time of it. But a lot of the games you would find would be like Kingmaker and Celasta and uh, Low Magic Age, games like these. What do these games have in common? They're all Pathfinder. Now, if you're not a tabletop person, let me explain. Pathfinder is nerd D&D. And I think that everybody who plays Pathfinder would agree with that. It was literally created when a bunch of people thought that D&D wasn't nerdy enough. Literally. So because of that, it and D&D are both the same kind of game. They're both arranged around a central figure called a GM who's responsible for making sure that the story happens in a way that makes sense and everybody has fun. And then there's a bunch of players who are participating. And in general, they're having a good time if you've got a good GM or not. Now, most of you know this because most of you who have, have at least seen it on Twitch or something, right? So you're aware that these games have very bloated combat rules. In my opinion, the reason for that is because combat allows these players to rail against the engine rather than the GM. This takes an enormous amount of weight off of the GM's shoulders and also shelters the GM from any sort of upset players because, you know, they're, they got a bad roll of the dice or whatever. Outside of combat, these systems have almost no rules. Why is that? Well, that's when the GM is doing their job. 
outside of combat, the GM plays the entire universe. They are the world, and they offer challenges, roleplay challenges, to the players who respond and back and forth. And because the GM is a human capable of human thought, they are able to interpret and respond to the player's actions while keeping the narrative flowing. This works really well, and it needs to be stressed. The reason that there aren't more non-combat rules in D&D and Pathfinder is because that would get in the way of the GM. So, let's move this into a computer. Oh no, where'd you go? Uh, hmm. This seems a little, um, barren. There's some stuff missing, like, uh, the entire world. The entire world is missing. The GM was responsible for being the entire world, and now that we've put it in a computer, there's no GM, and therefore there is no world. Oh, tough luck. All right, all right. So how can we make it so that there's a world to offer up role-playing challenges? Well, the most popular approach is to create a linear world. You have a story, and you stick to the story. The idea here is that if the player decides to make a different choice, it branches. Now, the problem with this is that the devs have to hard code every possible branch that the player would ever get to choose. This means the player isn't allowed to choose freely. They're only allowed to choose from options that the devs thought of and put in their game, and only when the devs want them to. This is tremendously expensive because the devs are forced to hard code every single possible response that the player could ever have. Anytime the player is faced with a role-playing opportunity, it's one that the devs have hard-coded into the game. That limits things on both the player's side and on the devs' side, but it's still extraordinarily expensive. You're going to find a lot of articles on how to try and keep this tangle under control. If you look up you know, linear RPG writing, there are a lot of ways to try and keep this from getting out of control, but at the end of the day, it's an extraordinarily expensive way to create a game. You literally have to write every possible thing that the player would ever want to do as a scripted beat. Ah, oh, nuts. That's, that's off the wall. That's super expensive. And that only works for linear games. What if we want our world to be an open world? How could we do something like that for an open world? What sort of situation can we create where the world will often will offer role-playing challenges? Well, one way is the Skyrim way. The Skyrim way says uh, you just do the linear way, but for every inch of the entire world. So if you ever see someone talk about how extraordinarily expensive an open world RPG is, that's because they're trying to do it like this, where it is effectively 10,000 open world RPGs. You have to manually script what the player will be able to do for every possible inch of the world, uh, regardless of the power level of the player, the class of the player, the race of the player, the gender of the player. You've got to script every possible opportunity and option manually. 10,000 fragmented, tiny little linear RPGs. Yeah, no shit that's expensive. Are you kidding me? That is, in fact, the wrong way to do it. Technically speaking, this is an open world RPG, but it's not using the open world role-playing mechanics I'd like to discuss. It's using linear mechanics, brute forcing them into an open world environment. So let's talk about some open world mechanics. There are plenty of open world RPGs, and I'm sure that you can think of dozens that are your favorite. But what I want to talk about is how we get this world to offer up role-playing challenges to the player. So let's look at some options. For example, we've got Kingmaker. Kingmaker took the opportunity to simply set up 
a city building game in their RPG. So most of the role playing challenges you face are related to the fact that you're trying to run a kingdom. Now the actual game for building your kingdom up is not really very role play heavy. It doesn't inherently offer a lot of role playing opportunities. You're more like a, a you know a, a god player, like a Sim City style player, rather than a specific character. But it does offer up the opportunity to allow your various uh, party members to do various things in character. You know, you send this one off to negotiate with those people. You send this one off to quell the demons in the swamps, and you send that one off to sell wood on the market, whatever. This is pretty decent. While it doesn't allow the player to play a role exactly, it allows the player to choose what their party members are going to do in this sort of situation. The rules of the city building part of Kingmaker offer us some role-playing opportunities for the background characters. It works pretty well. Now Kingmaker has a very strong central plotline. It's a time-based progression that you can't ignore. So they understood that this city building thing was not creating functional narratives on its own. This added some elements to the open world which allowed the player to sometimes do some role-playing related choices, but it didn't create an open world narrative. There's a normal linear narrative underneath it to keep the pace. Another option would be Salasta. Salasta is a fairly linear game, but it has some really cool open world roleplay features that I really love. One of the main features it uses is you can build all four of your main party members and then when you run into a situation where something needs to be done or said, rather than choosing what gets done or said, you choose which character is responsible for it. This means that there is a minimum of branching because you're not really branching, you're just choosing who gets to do the thing. There is some, but it's optional. Instead, the point here is that you're building up a roleplay experience inside of your party. You're building up a party dynamic rather than a world dynamic. So the world isn't offering you a roleplay opportunity to change the world. The world is offer offering you roleplay opportunities to change your understanding of your party. That's friggin' brilliant. I think they did it on accident because they don't use it very much. Another option would be a West Marches style game. Uh, Low, Magic Air, Low Magic Age is an example of a West Marches style game. This is a sort of game where you basically build your party and then boom, you're on a map, go. There's some cities. You want to do some city stuff? There's some forests. You want to do some forest stuff? Just go. West Marches style games are my favorite kind of open world role playing uh, game because they use open world role playing mechanics. The world actually contains mechanics to push you into various role play opportunities. But only if it's competent. And unfortunately, Low Magic Age, not so much. It is in early access, so I have hope that they'll rebalance it and create a functional result. But at the moment, it's not really working. This is also a problem I have with massively multiplayer RPGs where you can do anything and be anybody. But in practice, you can't because the mechanics are so badly balanced that you don't really have any sort of response uh, variance. You're not allowed to do a lot of different things. There's only a few things that actually matter. In Low Magic Age, for example, you can collect resources, and you can blacksmith, and you can craft stuff. Uh, you can take on quests. You can try and build up a city with, you know, supporting them. Uh, you can do all sorts of things, but none of these things matter because it's a Pathfinder game. So 99.9% .9 of the effort in the game is put towards making your characters combat hogs because combat is where 99.9% .9 of the rules are. There's no reason to ever blacksmith anything because you're going to find better weapons just randomly lying around. This is a part of the issue with this kind of game. If you're overly focused on one specific thing, then that is your role. It doesn't matter that you theoretically offer other roles. All of the power of the game is focused on putting you in that role. 
like if you're playing a massively multiplayer RPG um, that you can do anything in, but in order to even start doing anything, you have to log, you know, cut down 800 trees and then spend 10 hours crafting things out of those trees to grind your crafting up to the point where you'll be able to make whatever basic resources you need in order to do something else. That's not a role-playing game because I'm not being allowed to choose a role. I'm being forced to do a chore. And it's the same situation, although in the massively multiplayer example, the chore is chopping wood, and in the West Marches example, the chore is killing monsters. These worlds are not properly balanced to allow the player to create a role-playing path through them. That doesn't mean these games are necessarily bad, but they're not using the mechanics that I want them to use in the way I want them to use them. Naughty naughty, you should have asked me, I guess. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about how to balance these mechanics while still creating a good role-playing result, and talk about some of the mechanics involved. One of the most common situations that we're going to find in an open-world RPG is uh, the, the blender problem. The blender problem is uh, when you have something like, say, Pathfinder, and uh, you just throw it all into a blender and you hit blend, and then you get a nice smoothie of Pathfinder content. The problem is that this results in a completely undifferentiated final world, which means that no part of the world can offer you a unique roleplay experience. Every part of the world is basically the same as anywhere else. As an example, what is an elf? Well, I mean, I'm making my own party. I can literally choose elf and get a plus two dexterity. That means that elves are just another group of people in this world, and they live alongside all of the other fantasy species in this world. There's nothing particularly special about them aside from the fact that they have a plus two dex or whatever. They don't have any particular story attached to them. Now in a linear game, you can try and force them to have a story by writing an enormous amount of content that changes based on whether the player chose to be an elf or not. But in an open world game, the ability to build a party out of every species that could ever exist in this universe means that those species exist everywhere in this universe. It's just a giant blended mess of every piece of content that has ever shown up in any Pathfinder book. Unfortunately, that makes for a pretty poor adventure. A big part of what makes adventuring fun in an RPG is traveling from place to place and having those places be um, different. What your uh, role is will, off, will obviously be different if the place has different norms and different requirements. So that means that as you travel around, you want to be able to find places that are different so that your role really sparkles. You get to see it from a lot of different angles. So let me pitch you an alternative approach. Let's say that you're making a West March of the Style game where the player gets to make all of the characters in their starting party but they only have access to humans. Now the idea of that sort of game would be that this is a West Marches style map, sure, you can go anywhere you want, but you start here on the coast of human land, and then you can go wherever you want. And this will mean that you start with just humans, but as you adventure, you will run into new places like, oh, this is the land of the elves. We don't have any elves on our party. We literally can't have any elves on our party yet. We don't speak elven. We don't know what their, their world is like. And they don't have to be balanced because you can't have them on your party. So this can literally be anything we want. We can make the elves as exotic and strange as we please. You enter into this forest and you're lost and you're trying to find the elves and you have to run away because you, you run out of food, you're lost for so long, and then you come out and you find that you know, years have passed or something and you go back in and you try and find the land of the elves again and eventually you find it. And this is a new place with new rules and intricate new ideas. And then here's the kicker. 
You know, the elves wouldn't mind if one of your party members stayed behind as a diplomat, and you could make an elven character to replace them. Or maybe you go south into, you know, halfling lands, or north into dragon lands. The same basic approach applies. Each of these areas becomes distinct and interesting because you've limited what content the player can start with and allowed them to discover that content as they explore the world, which is kind of the point. And as they explore these worlds, uh, the player is going to start to understand what their roles actually mean. And that could mean things like, uh, you know, fighter, mage, uh, uh, cleric, you know, the standard combat roles. You could limit those and then start to open up more advanced classes as you move around. Um, but it also could just mean things like the nature of what it's like to be a human. The nature of what it's like to be a specific, you know, lawful good, chaotic evil, whatever, uh, alignment. These are all roles, and you could even push it further than that with the non-combat roles. If you want to allow things like blacksmithing, yeah, yeah, if you're a blacksmith adventurer here in human land, you're a human blacksmith adventurer in human land, you're not going to do very much. There's a million other blacksmiths in this area that specialize in it. You're not really that, that useful. But if you take that human blacksmith into elf land, they don't do steel. They don't understand steel. They're all wood and stuff. Oh my god, did you just find a cool new reason to be a blacksmith? Oh wait, there's the elven version of the blacksmith that makes things out of wood. Get one on your party, go back to human land. Oh, now you've upset the balance of human land because you're, you can make super cool elven weapons. Maybe you can even find a way to mix elven wood and human steel. These are opportunities for you to expand on your role and to discover what that role can mean in this world. And that is the point. The point is that the world offers you options and allows you to role play, allows you to expand on what your role is and what it means in this world. And that becomes a whole lot easier if the world varies. Because if the world changes from place to place, then your role changes from place to place, and this all needs to be on purpose. If it just varies randomly because you think it might be cool to vary it randomly, then your roles will not change. If you can choose every single class and every single race when you start the game, and then you wander over into Elfland, that's not going to end up being very new because you can have a party that's mostly elves. Now, you could try and write it. You could try and make variants on how Elfland works, depending on how many elves you have in your party at the time. Do you know how expensive that would be? Very. Yeah, so it makes a lot more sense to limit the player and then allow them to explore their roles in other contexts. This also involves making sure that the various role choices they make have a limited scope. For example, the elves don't use gold, so it doesn't matter how rich you are, they don't give a single shit. But it also means that we can do open world roleplay mechanics on a much more tidy scale. Let's say that you go into a dungeon and you face down a locked door and your thief character is like, I'm going to pick this lock. And they're like, oh no, I didn't manage to pick the lock. I guess we can't open the door. What are we going to do? So in a tabletop game, that would mean that the players would have to think of a way around the door. Maybe they smash it down. Maybe they go in through a window. Maybe they wait for a guard patrol to come out of the door and then ambush them. It's an opportunity to think about what to do next in your role as an aggressive adventurer trying to get through a door. But of course, in a computer game, we don't see that happen. In a computer game, if you fail to pick the door lock, you're SOL. The door is forever closed. And that's why all of these role-playing games feature skill tests that don't matter. Because you're going to fail them, and if you fail them, it's going to lock you out of whatever is going on. But 
we don't have to be like that. We can create a mechanical progression. We can do this by giving the dungeon a set of rules. And this is pretty common. I mean, if you've played things like Invisible Ink, then you've already seen most of the rules we're going to be talking about. Is the dungeon on alert? Is it day or night? Are people coming to a specific location to look for you? This sort of setup will allow you to make choices and then have fallbacks. Like, oh, did you get locked out? Well, what are you going to do now? Are you going to bust down the door? That will raise their alert level. Are you going to try and find a window to get in? That'll take some time, but you might find one. Are you going to, you know, wait for the shift of the guards? That will happen at a specific time because time passes in a specific way. By having rules about how an adventure will unfold in this way, we can allow the adventure to have fallbacks and we can allow the player to arrange their party differently and handle failures differently and it will work and it can change from place to place. If we screw up this particular dungeon or if we ace this particular dungeon, the result isn't going to have a massive effect on our worldwide dungeoneering score. If we ace it, we find some better loot and maybe we improve a town nearby. If we fail it, Maybe someone from town thinks that we're kind of a jackass, or we make an enemy out of someone who's in the dungeon, or something like that. But the long-term effects are rather limited. This is important. If the player is going to be allowed to try and experiment with their role and push their role, they need to be able to do that in a relatively safe place. This means that any time they want to experiment with their role, it has to be in a way that they can run away from, they can escape. And that includes dungeoneering. Do you want to try and get through a dungeon with no thieves, or is your thief kind of crappy? Well, maybe you shouldn't tackle the most, you know, lock-filled dungeons, but you can try. Find a way around them, smash your way through. What sort of results do you think that'll have? Let's find out. Once you're, you know, a week away uh, to the west somewhere, it's okay if it didn't go so great. You learn something, and you have a piece of story now. You now know more about who these people are. It's the same as I was just talking about. Previously, I was talking about, you know, the humans are here and the elves are here and so on and so forth. This is the same basic idea, except for, of course, we're talking about something much smaller scale, a specific challenge, a dungeon. And it doesn't have to be a dungeon. I'm using a dungeon because everybody uses dungeons. But it could be like you go into a city and there are social challenges. Those sorts of things are the same. Either way, the idea is that there has to be some amount of partitioning so that when the player experiments with different roles, they're not permanently destroying themselves if they ever screw up by even a little bit. This will also allow you to make those rules drift over time and space. These are open world role play mechanics. These are mechanisms and systems that make it possible to do open world role play in a way that doesn't require a million lines of custom dialogue and it doesn't require you to make an action game. You can make it an action game if you want, but we're still going to have those open world role play mechanisms inside of it. Now, a lot of these mechanisms are partially uh, overlapping with something like, uh, you know, Thief, uh, and that's fine. Because our focus here isn't on making sure that these are absolutely unique in every way. Our focus here is making sure that the world offers you role playing challenges and opportunities. Okay? I hope this was clear. It's more of a theoretical setup, so let me know if you didn't understand it or if you have other opinions. See ya!